Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending today's uh, webinar, the Poison Prevention Packaging Act. Uh, my name is Stefan Lee. I'm with the Small Business Ombudsman team, and I will be presenting the information today. Uh, a couple of things uh, before we get started here. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and a copy of the video will be available on YouTube. A uh, PDF of the slides will be distributed via email to all registrants, not just attendees, uh, and a link to download the slide deck will be available on the business guidance page. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them through the GoToWebinar interface so that we can keep track of them. Um, if there are any unanswered questions, uh, they will be addressed in the days following the webinar. Uh, throughout this presentation, there are a few polling questions where you can gauge your knowledge of the requirements, so I highly encourage you to participate. And with that, let's get started. All right, so today we're going to be going over uh, the special packaging requirements, certification related to the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, uh, Section 15B reporting, and then we'll go over any uh, questions and answers um, that may have been asked. Um, there are, these are a couple of pieces of information, uh, cpsc.gov slash PPPA, that is the short link for our business guidance page. It has all the uh, staff information about the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, and 16 CFR Part 1700 is where the Poison Prevention Packaging Act requirements are codified. Uh, throughout this presentation, I will be referencing CFR a lot. Um, there's a lot of citations to kind of jump back and forth through. Um, so I highly recommend, uh, if you haven't already, to go to check out um, ecfr.gov. Uh, this search bar right here, you can type in um, the CFR reference and it'll take you to that particular text. All right, so special packaging is required for certain household substances. The specific list of substances that require the special packaging is at 16 CFR uh, section 1700.14a. If it's not on this list, it is technically not subject to the PPPA. The requirements can be amount and form specific. We'll see examples of that later in this presentation. And CPSC uh, regulates the package and not the substance. So that's kind of important to consider uh, when we're talking about things like drugs that require special packaging. Because CPSC doesn't regulate the drug, that would fall under the Food and Drug Administration. The special package requirement applies to the immediate package, not any kind of secondary packaging or another package outside of that immediate package. Uh, the responsible party is going to be the domestic manufacturer or the importer of record. For the purposes of the PPPA, um, the manufacturer would be the entity placing the regulated substance in the packaging. So here we're going to be de defining a household substance. Uh, that's going to be any substance that is customarily produced or distributed for sale for cons consumption or use or customarily stored by individuals in or about the household and which is a hazardous substances, uh, a hazardous substance per the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, a food drug or cosmetic per the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act, or a fuel stored in portable container used in the heating, cooking, or refrigeration system of a house. This definition is available at 16 CFR section 1700.1b2. And we'll define a package, uh, which is going to be the immediate container or wrapping in which the substance is contained for consumption, use, or storage by the consumers. This would exclude bulk packaging, or any kind of shipping or outer packaging, unless that is the only package for the substance. Getting into a little finer detail here, what is special packaging? And that's going to be packaging that is difficult for children under five years of age to open, but is not difficult for, for adults to open. This is commonly referred to as child resistant and senior friendly or simply child resistant packaging or CRP, which stands for child resistant packaging. Uh, a lot of people were, will erroneously refer to it as child proof packaging. Uh, it is very important to note that this is child resistant, not child proof. Uh, it's not a guarantee that it's going to prevent all, all children from accessing.
Under the PPPA, uh, special packaging has four provisions. These are going to be found at 16 CFR section 1700.15. The first is going to be general requirements. Uh, the special packaging, namely the closure, has to function for the lifetime of the package. And the substance must not affect a closure mechanism. So for example, uh, if you have a high volatile liquid and it starts melting the plastic of the closure and now the closure starts either uh, gumming up or the special packaging function no longer works, that would not be allowed. Uh, the effective specifications, that's going to be the child test and the senior adult or the younger adult test. The re reuse of special packaging, basically that substances that need this, that are subject to this provision may not reuse the special package. And then there's the restricted flow provision uh, where no more than two milliliters of a substance is dispensed when the package is inverted, opened and taken, squeezed or activated once. All right, so we're coming up on our first polling question here. All right, I only sell products to businesses. Are my products subject to the PPPA? I'm gonna give you guys a few seconds to answer here. All right, and it looks like um, most people here have voted yes. Uh, so the answer actually is going to be, well, it really depends on a variety of factors. Uh, so it's a bit of a trick question here. Um, this is based on the updated guidance uh, on substances not intended for household use. Uh, this letter was issued February 18th, 2022. Uh, it is available under the enforcement guidance section at the PPPA business guidance page. Um, it, was, uh, it was published as a result, or rather posted as a result of marketplace changes, namely increase in online sales, uh, where the manufacturer or repackager may sell products intended for commercial use, but downstream distributors may resell to consumers. Uh, the letter effectively states that there's no institutional use exception under the PPPA, so firms can't simply label their products as out of scope or use a statement like for institutional use only. Uh, what that basically means is that manufacturers who do strictly B2B or business to business sales uh, may need to take a look at their uh, distribution, their distribution model and chain to see uh, how the products or if the products are going to be diverted into the consumer marketplace and take steps to prevent that. All right, our second question here. Can you use the same cap on a different bottle than the one that was tested? All right, and it looks like um, a large majority have said no. Uh, and the answer here, well, that's going to depend. Uh, testing has to adequately reflect the final product. Um, so glass bottles may be inherently easier to open due to a lower coefficient of friction between the bottle and the closure threading. Different plastic material or even different sizes may make it easier to grip and open the bottle. So effectively what this means is that you need to make sure that whatever was tested adequately represents the product that is being uh, manufactured. Right. Another question here, if the type of plastic used is changed, uh, let's say from a high density polyethylene to polypropylene, do I need to retest my package?
All right, and it looks like the um, majority of you have said, yes, uh, it does need retesting. Uh, and that's generally going to be correct. Uh, different types of plastics can behave differently during the protocol testing, uh, you know, whether the plastic is going to be softer or harder, uh, whether it has a higher friction or lower friction. Um, so therefore, retesting would be required for different plastic types. All right, so here is a list of substances, or rather a list of drugs uh, that require uh, special packaging under the PPPA. Uh, the regulation does specify whether this is going to be an oral dose or a general use consumption. Uh, the regulation will also specify any kind of prerequisites or exemptions. Um, for example, there are petitions from the for, for exemption of the PBPA packaging requirements um, that are submitted as part of 16 CFR Part 1702. You'll see a lot of those under the prescription drugs. Um, so under that specific regulation, there's a list of specific prescription drugs um, that are exempt from the uh, special packaging requirements. Uh, if you look over here, over-the-counter drug is also included. Um, this is based on when the drug was switched from prescription only to over-the-counter, uh, and that is going to be based on the application that was submitted to the FDA on or after January 29, 2002. It is going to be substance specific, so not necessarily firm specific. So let's say one firm submitted their petition first um, for a particular substance. So now that substance is considered an over-the-counter drug um, based on this uh, regulation, or that is rather that is subject to this regulation. And here's a list of other substances that are not necessarily drugs. Um, again, the regulation is going to specify any kind of form or prerequisites or exemptions. And same with the drugs, uh, there, are, there can be petitions submitted for exemptions uh, from the special packaging requirements. Here's an example of one of the regulatory texts, uh, aspirin, uh, which is going to be the first substance. Um, if you notice here, it does say dosage form intended for oral administration. There's a couple of exemptions that are listed under this regulation. Um, the one thing I do want to kind of call out is uh, these three provisions under 1700.15. Uh, it says that aspirin needs to be in package that meets A, B, and C. So that's going to be the first three provisions. Um, and then if you look at this next one, which is going to be for sodium and potassium hydroxide, um, you'll notice that it has a specific uh, requirement uh, depending on whether it's dry form or all other types of forms. Um, it's going to be either 10% or 2%. And then if you look at the provisions here, it's only going to be the first two provisions compared to the aspirin one. So C is missing from this uh, particular uh, substance. And that's going to be for all, all of the regulated substances. Each one will have its own set of provisions uh, that it is subject to. All right, next question here. Are cannabis and similar products subject to the special packaging requirements of the PPPA? All right, uh, and it looks like uh, most people have said, yes, it is required. So this is gonna be a bit of a trick question. Um, so 16 CFR section 1700.14A4 does have a requirement for controlled drugs that are in dosage form intended for oral administration um, that are also subject to the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act to require special packaging. So since marijuana is a Schedule One drug under this act, it technically requires special packaging if it is in a dosage form intended for oral administration. Having said all of that, uh, individual states do sometimes incorporate 16 CFR Part 1700 as part of their state laws, um, and responsible parties should contact the agency overseeing the state requirements for more information. Um, that is not something that CPSC is enforcing. It is not a CPSC requirement.
Another question here, uh, can equivalent standards such as an ISO, EN, or CSA standard be used to certify compliance with the PPPA? Right, uh, and it looks like just about half, a little more than half, has said no. And, and that's largely going to be correct. Uh, there are differences between the various standards and the PPPA, uh, such as deviations in the testing protocol and even what's considered a pass-fail for the overall test. Um, there's a big asterisk here to consider. Uh, there was an enforcement discretion uh, from the CPSC during uh, the height of COVID period. Um, so packages tested between June 25th and tw uh, June 25th, 2020 to June 30th, 2022, uh, were allowed to use these equivalent standards or these other international standards uh, to comply with the special packaging requirements. Um, there is an FAQ on this. I highly recommend you look at the extension letter dated November 12th, 2020 on the PPPA business guidance page for more information. All right, so we're going to get into some exemptions and exceptions here. Uh, so bulk drugs intended to be repackaged by a pharmacist aren't subject to the special packaging requirements. Uh, prescription drugs at the request of the patient or physician, basically if a consumer or a doctor basically says they don't want the special package, um, those don't have to be in special packaging. Uh, prescription drug samples also don't require it. Um, there is an FR notice related to this. Uh, aftermarket drug organizers like pill minders or a little containers where you put the pills in to remind you to take it every day or every morning, something like that. Uh, those are aftermarket um, products that aren't subject to the special packaging requirements. And then finally, we have products that are not used in or around the household. Again, bear in mind that updated guidance on substances not intended for household use. Um, there are some FAQs there and some additional information uh, that may provide a little more uh, information on, on this particular area. Uh, the PPPA has something what we like to call the non-complying package provision that's going to be found at 16 CFR section 1700.5. Uh, basically allows one non-popular size to use conventional packaging. So basically any package that doesn't use a special package closure. Uh, it assumes that all other sizes are using special packaging. Uh, it has to be labeled using one of these two statements. Uh, liquid drain cleaners that are con that contain 10% or more of sodium or potassium hydroxide are not allowed this particular exemption. Uh, that is because under that uh, CFR reference there, um, any such products that don't use special packaging are a banned hazardous substance. And this does not apply to prescription drugs. So there's just no way that prescription drugs can kind of comply with these particular provisions. Um, so I did mention that it has to be a non-popular size. So if the sale volume changes, firms are expected to switch packaging in a timely manner. Um, this one size exemption also does apply to different doses. So if, for example, let's say you have an 81 milligram product and a 200 milligram product, each of those would uh, be allowed a non-compliant package. It's also form dependent. Uh, so let's say you have a gel cap and a tablet. So each of those different forms will also be uh, provided a non-compliant package size. Next, we're going to go over the child test protocol. It is a lot of information, um, but it is found all at 16 CFR section 1700.20A2. Uh, so the child test protocol is essentially up to four panels of 50 children that are tested in pairs. Uh, the age range is anywhere between 42 and 51 months old, distributed in the percentages that you see listed there. There is a gender restriction, uh, which basically means that 50% has to be uh, boys and 50% has to be girls. There is a 10% difference uh, uh, allowed between the genders per each of the three age categories. 
there's a tester restriction. Uh, so no more than 30% of the children can be tested by a single tester. And also a site restriction, which basically means no more than 20% of the children can be from a single site. Continuing along, uh, the child test protocol it consists of a five minute period where the children are given the package to try and open. The package is then taken away from them and there's a demonstration to show the opening of the package, just normal opening, no exaggerated movements or repeats or anything like that. And then the, ch the children are given uh, another uh, five minute period to try and open the package again. During the second five minute period, if um, neither of the children uh, were using their teeth, uh, they, the testers are instructing the children then that they may use their teeth. Uh, the, for it to be a special package, it has to be effective at least 85% pre-demonstration and then 80% post-demonstration. And a failure is going to consist of a leaking package, uh, a package that's opened or, or gained access through any means, uh, so like chewing a hole through the packaging or just normal, op normal opening. Uh, for unit dose packaging, that's going to be gaining access to a number of units, maximum of nine, which produces a serious personal injury or illness to a 25 pound child. This is commonly referred to as an F value, which is discussed later on. So I mentioned earlier that it's four panels of 50 children. Um, so that effectively is to try and reduce the number of children uh, that are going to be tested at any given time. Um, so with the first panel of 50 children, uh, if you have zero to three failures uh, in the first five minutes and then zero to five failures in the full 10 minutes, that's automatically going to be a pass. You don't have to test the next panel of children. Uh, if you fall into the continue column and on either side, so for example, let's say you have uh, four failures uh, before the first five minutes uh, and or during the first five minutes and then five failures total. Um, one of them still falls into the continue column. Therefore, you would need to test another 50 panel of children. Here's our unit dose example. Um, so this is just a mock uh, mock example of uh, how many uh, how many children accessed however many unit doses or how many blisters rather. Uh, it's uh, the data is provided in two different ways. The first chart, uh, the first table at the top shows um, you know however many children were able to access that many units specifically, whereas the second table shows a consecutive number of failures. So the first column that says one plus, so that's any number of children that were able to open at least one unit and then two units, three units, so on and so forth. Um, the data is kind of easier to look at uh, for the second half um, or the second, uh, the second set uh, because the depending on what you're putting into the actual blister pack, uh, you may have different F values. So compliance of the package can depend on that F value, um, which is why gener it's generally recommended to run the test all the way up to nine plus in case the package is suitable for other substances. This is bearing in mind that um, you know, whatever, what you're putting into that package um, may affect the children's ability to open it. So let's say the shape of the pill is very different or it's a softer pill, um, which means they can't kind of poke it through the actual foil package. Um, so these are all things that need to be considered if you plan on using a different substance for that unit dose package. Um, same thing is going to uh, apply for um, for the, the the failures and and the, the the number of panels that need to be uh, that need to be used, um, so if you look at here, if you have um, an F value of one, that's going to be 15 children that opened it, so that's going to be an automatic failure. Uh, if you had 10, or if you have an F value of three, that's going to be 10 children that uh, that opened it, so you have 10 failures, so that falls into the continue column. And then finally, uh, if you have an F value of six, um, that uh, during this test only five children had gained access, so that's probably going to be a pass. Uh, if you need assistance with F value determinations, uh, you can send an email to regulatory enforcement at cpsc.gov with all of your data. Uh, CPSC staff will not determine the F value for you. Uh, they'll only indicate if the firm's proposed F value is appropriate based on whatever data that they're submitting. Next, we're going to be going over the senior adult test protocol. So that's always going to be 100 adults that are tested individually. Um, 
like the child test, there is an age range from 50 to 70 split into three different age categories. Uh, there's also a gender restriction, but is more biased towards females. So that's going to be 30% male and 70% females. Um, there's also a tester restriction, which is going to be 35%, um, and then a site restriction, which is going to be 24%. This does differ from the child test, so that is something to keep in mind. Uh, there's also a consent form that's associated with the senior adult test protocol. Um, they're given five minutes to open and close one package, and then one minute to open and close a second package. Um, seniors that are not able to, to actually do this test are given a screening procedure for their ability to open a conventional package. So that's typically going to be a regular threaded closure and then a snap closure. If they're able to open both of them, um, that just means that they can open normal packages, but they can't use this special package. Um, so their data is basically kept in as a failure. If they're not able to complete the screening procedure, um, then their data is just not counted. Uh, so the senior desk test protocol has to be effective at least 90%, which basically means 90% have to be able to complete and uh, pass this test, which is going to be opening and closing both packages as, app as applicable. And then it also includes any failures during an applicable uh, resecuring test. Uh, the resecuring test is going to be visible, uh, sorry, is going to be required when an objective determination, anything that's visual or mechanical, that a, pro that a package is properly resecured cannot be made. So, for example, there's a lot of these uh, closures that when the special package is re-engaged, you'll hear a little click. Um, so that's going to be a mechanical determination or a lot, uh, another package like a snap top where you have to line up the arrows before uh, opening it. Um, if the arrows are misaligned, then you know that the, um, the resecuring was completed. So those, are, those don't have to uh, undergo this resecuring test. All right, so here's a, an example for the senior adults test. So let's say you have uh, nine, 100 out of 100 packages, 92 of them pass the senior adult test, which basically means you have eight failures. You have to pre-calculate 20% acceptable child failures. That is because during the normal child protocol test, 20% um, uh, of the children can open a special package. It accounts for that. So that means of the 92 packages, 18.4 is going to be acceptable failures. Um, so let's say uh, when you do the resecuring test, you have 10 children that are able to uh, open the package. Uh, so doing the calculation here, 10 minus the 18.4 is going to be zero additional failures because you have a negative number. So your SAUE, which is your senior adult use effectiveness, is going to be 100, which is the number of packages you started with, minus eight, which is the eight failures from the senior adult test, minus zero, which is the additional failures from the uh, resecuring test. So that's going to be 92%. So this is going to pass. So let's say you have 20 child failures instead. So now you have 20 minus 18.4, which now means you have 1.6 additional failures. So your SAUE is going to be 100 minus eight, minus 1.6, which is 90.4. This is still going to pass because it's still above that 90% rate. Once you get to 21 child failures, now you have 2.6 additional failures. Your SAUE, all calculated, dips below 90 to 89.4. So now this package fails the senior adult test. Uh, there is a younger adult test protocol. Uh, this is 100 adults tested individually, um, an age range of 18 to 45 years old. Uh, there's also a gender restriction, a tester restriction, and a site restriction, um, which both the tester and site restriction, I, I believe, differ from the senior adult test. Uh, the reasons why we have that, um, this is applicable for products in aerosol form and require metal containers. Uh, firms have to show a need for such a container. It is used in lieu of the senior adult test. Um, but same things apply. You have five minutes to open and close. Uh, the package, and it has to be effective at least 90%, including failures during an applicable resecuring test. All right, so that was the uh, PPPA uh, testing requirements. We're now going to go to the certification requirements. Uh, Section 14A of the Consumer Product Safety Act uh, basically require, uh, requires that certificates are available for products subject to a consumer product safety rule, standard, ban, or regulation. 
it is going to be the responsibility of the domestic manufacturer or importer to generate and maintain a GCC. Uh, testing for compliance with the PPPA does not need to be conducted by a third-party CPSC accepted laboratory. So technically that means that testing can be done in-house by the manufacturer, but there are some issues with potentially having access to the number of children required, meeting all those different restrictions and criteria. Um, so typically uh, a lot of firms will just work with um, some kind of laboratory or some um, that, that is able to uh, do the package test for them. There's no requirement to pre-submit any kind of certificates to CPSC. Uh, staff may request it as part of a compliance case. Um, there's no template or format to follow as long as the required elements are present. We're going to go into those elements later on in, in the uh, presentation. Another question here. Uh, I was provided a test report or certificate from my bottle supplier. Do I need to create a GCC? Right, and it looks like uh, an overwhelming majority of you have said yes. Um, and that's correct. Um, if you are the entity introducing the regulated substance to the packaging, you're considered the manufacturer, therefore you need to create the GCC. Uh, under 16 CFR part 1109, um, the manufacturer of the finished product can rely on a supplier's test report or certificate if certain requirements are met. Uh, however, those forms still need to create their own GCC for the finished product. They can't just forward whatever certificate was provided to them by the packed bottle supplier. So here are the seven elements that's required on a GCC. Um, a couple of misunderstandings here, numbers one and five, they talk about identification of the product and the date and place of manufacture for the product. These are related to the finished product and not the actual empty bottle. So we're not talking about um, identification of what kind of bottle you have, it's the specific uh, finished product. We'll see an example of that. Uh, and then number three here, identification of the importer or domestic manufacturer. Um, as uh, reiterated many times here, that's going to be the entity introducing the regulated substance to the package and not the manufacturer of the empty bottle. Um, so a bit of a disclaimer here, the following slides portray a fictitious example for uh, a GCC. Uh, any resemblance or similarity to actual persons or other real life entities is purely coincidental. All right, so identification of the product. Um, this first example is going to have this 28-400 white PPP, a white PP continuous threaded closure with HDPE bottle. That is a description of the bottle. So this is not allowed for the fin finished product GCC. Uh, we would want to see the actual product. So one, two, three, pain be gone aspirin in specific dosages and in specific counts. Uh, we do ask that it be as specific as possible, list all the different types of forms um, that's going to require that special package. The uh, second element is going to be the citation to the uh, safety rule. So for PPPA, that's going to be pretty simple. That's just 16 CFR Part 1700 uh, Poison Prevention Packaging. Um, there is additional uh, uh, regulations that may reference uh, uh, 1700 or have similar requirements to the PPPA. Those are kind of discussed later. Uh, those should cite that specific safety rule instead of 16 CFR Part 1700. Uh, we'll see examples of what that looks like. Number three is the identification of the importer or domestic manufacturer. Again, that's going to be the entity that's placing the regulated substance in the package. So it's not going to be your bottle supplier. It's going to be your company, um, your, your company name, your company address, um, and a phone number. Number four is going to be contact information for individuals maintaining test results. Um, so in this instance, the contact information from the package supplier, supplier is acceptable if they're the ones actually maintaining copies of the test results. However, the responsible party must be able to facilitate uh, CPSC staff obtaining copies of those test results. Uh, contact information does have to be to a specific person um, and have direct email or direct phone number. Um, general box uh, information or general 
general email boxes or general phone numbers are are probably not going to work here unless they're always going to be manned um, and someone is going to be able to readily uh, reply. Number five is the date and place of manufacture. Um, so here's an example here. You can use a date range. Um, if you'll note that the uh, the place of manufacture is going to be the uh, part of the firm that actually made the aspirin and not the empty bottle supplier. The date is going to require a month and year at minimum. Uh, ranges are acceptable as long as the tested product um, continues to adequately represent whatever is still being manufactured. Uh, place is going to require something more than countries, so city, state, province is applicable. Number six is going to be date and place of testing. Um, so that's pretty pretty straightforward. Again, month and year for the date of testing, and then place is going to be something more specific than just a country. And then finally, you'll have the identification of the testing laboratory. Um, so just put the laboratory's information here, their name, address, and some contact information. All right, so as discussed previously, um, there are other standards that reference special packaging. Um, here's a few of them. Uh, so liquid nicotine packaging under 15 USC section 1472A um, references back to 1700.15 um, or the PPPA. However, the certificates for liquid nicotine uh, products should cite 15 USC section 1472A instead of 16 CFR part 1700. Uh, same with the other two here, portable gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel containers. Uh, they're subject to 16 CFR Part 1460, which actually incorporates by reference STM uh, F2517. Um, that has its own test protocol, um, whereas the other two on this list actually reference the test protocol under the PPPA. Uh, so that's something to consider there. And then recently we had uh, Reese's Law, which is Public Law 117-171. Uh, Section 3A of the of Reese's Law does require special packaging for button cell or coin batteries. Uh, so again, if uh, your products fall under these requirements, uh, please list those citations instead of 16 CFR Part 1700. Right. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, my testing was done 10 years ago. Is it still valid? Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, and it looks like um, a little more than half said maybe. And the answer is pretty much the same there, maybe. Um, it's yes, assuming that there are no material changes uh, since the original test. Um, having said that, there may be a larger question of whether or not there really weren't any material changes in those 10 years. Um, so a couple of things uh, to consider when uh, when it's being retested. Uh, so changes in the manufacturing process. Um, so that's going to be any kind of raw material changes. Um, so the source of where you get your plastic pellets, uh, the actual manufacturing process, if you're switching out your plastic injectors uh, or when you have a new package design, all of these would trigger some kind of retesting. Um, if you swap out the package type, size, or shape, that would also probably require retesting. Anytime there's a receipt of incident reports or complaints, and then if there's any kind of manu manufacturing defects um, to try and figure out where those defects are occurring. Uh, speaking of incident reports and manufacturing defects, um, we'll segue here into Section 15B reporting. So under Section 15B of the Consumer Product Safety Act, firms are required to report defective products that pose a substantial risk of injury. 
products that create an unreasonable risk of serious injury or death, or products that fail to comply with a consumer product safety rule, or any other rule regulation standard or ban enforced by the commission. So that third bullet point there is going to be, if you know your product fails to meet the special packaging requirements, you are obligated to report. Uh, initial reports need to be submitted immediately upon receipt of information related to the product issue or incidents. So immediate is going to be within 24 hours of knowledge. Um, the questions for an initial support are available at 16 CFR section 1115.13C. And then after the submission of initial report, uh, full reports are generally going to be required unless informed otherwise by CPSC staff. Those questions are available at 16 CFR section 1115.13D. Uh, Section 15B reports can be submitted online through saferproducts.gov. We generally recommend it. Um, this is a very easy way to get all the information. It'll tell you which specific piece of information it's, you need to submit. You can also submit them uh, via email to section15 at cpsc.gov. Generally recommend including Section 15B report or something similar in the subject line. Uh, reporting does not mean that a case will be opened or that additional corrective actions will be required. It's just a just your obligation to submit that report. Submissions are treated as confidential uh, as allowed by law. All right, and that sums up the requirements under the PPPA. And so let's see if there's any questions that were submitted. Uh, looks like there's one here asking, uh, does the PPPA apply to button and coin cell batteries, either open stock or as packaged with a consumer product? Uh, for example, flashlight with batteries not installed, rather provided in a Ziploc style bag. Um, so as we had discussed previously, um, this is going to fall under Reese's law, not the PPPA. So there's, it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, that's going to be this third bullet point here, public law 117-171 section 3A. So if you have loose button cell or coin batteries in the package uh, or in the finished product, that's going to require special packaging, but only because it's referenced under Reese's law, not because it is a regulated substance under the PPPA. Um, essentially, it, it means that you're still going to require special packaging um, that meets the PPPA requirements, um, but the difference is going to be um, what you put on your citation. Um, this is going to apply whether those batteries are included with the product or being sold separately. So if you go to a grocery store and you go to that battery aisle, um, all the button cell or coin batteries uh, there would need the special packaging um, if they were manufactured or imported after March 19th, uh, 2024, which was the effective date. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, what happens if I get a report of a child who managed to get into one of our packages, got hurt, but the package passed special packaging requirements? Uh, do I need to make a Section 15 report? Um, I definitely recommend that you start an initial report for 15B um, just to kind of cover your reporting obligation for receiving an incident. Um, the firms are provided some time to do to, to do their own investigation to figure out the actual source of the problem, if there was a problem, um, and then they can follow up with the CPSC staff to conclude and close out their case. Uh, here's another question here. Uh, what would you recommend as the best way to monitor updates to the PPPA to ensure that we have the most up-to-date information? Uh, the best way to do that um, is going to be a couple of several ways. Um, one thing uh, that I highly recommend you do is you subscribe to uh, the Small Business Ombudsman's Business Education Newsletter. So that's going to be cpsc.gov slash email uh, and then check the box for business education. Um, for the regulatory uh, rulemaking stuff, um, I recommend that you go to the federalregister.gov, uh, look up Consumer Product Safety Commission, and then you, you can subscribe to any kind of notices of proposed rulemaking or uh, final rules or any, anything like that, um, and you'll get an email notification anytime CPSC posts uh, something along those lines. All right, another question here. Uh, my product passed child testing but failed senior testing. Can I still use it? Um, unfortunately, you're not able to use that package. Uh, one of the provisions under the special packaging requirements is that it is both ch uh, child 
resistant and senior friendly or rather and adult friendly so you would need to pass both test protocols in order to for it to be considered special packaging all right um i think that's all the questions we have um uh, here's uh, again our SBO's contact information. Feel free if you have any questions um, to just reach out to us directly. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to answer your questions. If not, we can facilitate getting uh, getting you the answers to your specific questions. You can reach us through the contact form, cpsc.gov slash SBO contact. Uh, you can call and leave a voicemail uh, at the toll free number there, or you can email us at SBO at cpsc.gov. All right. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar today and uh, hope, hope you have a good rest of your day.